ride to school on the school bus. Uh, you'd think we were only three miles out of town, but in order to get to school, I had to go clear up past Sunday River Covered Bridge and back in before I could get to town. So it was a long ride, and I was got car sick. And I also felt like my class was the class that everything changed every time, every year going through. Oh, we're going to experiment with this this year. <laughs> and waiting for eighth grade, you're going to have your eighth grade graduation. That was the year they decided we will no longer have eighth grade graduation. <laughs> we go to school. We have Mr. Vash on one year. Ah, that was the year he retires and we had a new new uh, headmaster and things went downhill. <laughs> and then, oh, we're no longer going to Google. Now you're going to Telstar. <laughs> and that was the first of, of when I was at Google dresses also. And, and then I get to Telstar and it was total freedom. <laughs> Everything, <laughs> kids were going back and forth as Levi will tell you. Um, and then um, as a senior, instead of the top 10, that year we're going to have the top five. So it was, it was every year, it just felt like you missed out on something in my class growing up. So it was kind of an experimental class going through. So I'm back teaching. Hopefully it's not that way for my kids. Okay, thanks. Levi? Stan, if I could come up with a key to Hill House, I think it would have been a perfect job. <laughs>
kids, we organized our own games on the field or behind the primary school. And one thing I remember, we could always, he was a wonderful man, some of you will remember him, Merchie Gordon, who was the minister to Methodist Church. Very kind-hearted soul. He wasn't the best driver in the world, <laughs> but we would talk him into hauling us up to West Bethel to play the West Bethel team in a trailer. He'd haul a trailer behind his car. Can you imagine eight to ten kids driving a trailer, a two-wheel trailer in the back? I wouldn't do it today. He wouldn't be allowed to. But I'll never forget it. He was a wonderful man. Anybody else over here? Well, I remember playing in the Bethel Bluebirds. I played your, violin. That was your most vivid memory? Well, yes. Dick <laughs> <laughs> Young and Henry Hastings and Raleigh Chapman, who was supposed to be here tonight. Yeah, yeah. Sid Howe. Rodney. And uh, he didn't play them later. The original Bluebirds. The original right? Bluebirds. Yeah, they were just, uh, I was the only violinist. Well, I was going to say, he played and violin. Yep, so yeah, yeah. Or later. On the, uh, the <laughs> when I got to be about 15 or 16, he played. This was a young group, yeah. and Dick and Henry, uh, Dick Young was a character, and of course a lot of you remember him. He called Henry Hastings Henny Penny Good Fat. Ella was so good, we looked at her house to rehearse, you know. <laughs> and Dick and Henry were always fooling around, you know. Sid Howe was a pretty good kid. He played banjo, you know. He lived in Bethel, but Dick and Henry. Penny, penny, good fat. So I can remember <laughs> telling Barbara that. So she had to tell Cindy later on when they got in high school how Dick used to call her father, Henny, penny, good fat. <laughs> then we put, uh, the most vivid thing, I think, that I remember playing over the radio. We went, and then we got us a chance to play over WCSH. And we went, I was 12, and Dick was probably 15 and stuff like that. Wally was uh, a couple years older than I, three years older than I. And, uh, and we all went down to Portland and played over WCSH. And it was quite a thrill, believe me. That was my first and only appearance on radio. <laughs> <laughs> Never been on TV. <laughs> <laughs> start to have uh, warm, uh, I mean, 
75 plus weather in May, you remember it when you're sitting in school and looking out the window, you know, and wishing you were out outside. And it would last right through the September. Now, I think that uh, over the last few years we've had uh, one week or summer and sometime in June or July. <laughs> That's about it. But uh, another thing, uh, pleasant memories are being able to not lock your doors at night and hitchhiking out to um, Sanga Pond to go swimming, whether there was Red Cross lessons or not, or being able to hitchhike down to Bryant Pond and swim like Christopher and things like that. And the characters that we used to have around town, um, like the Krause and Tim,
declared the end of the war that afternoon, and uh, and I can't remember the characters. And I tried to ask Dan this week if he'd ever heard these stories, but uh, three pulp trucks <coughs> proceeded to drag three jump cars upside down around the streets of Bethel all afternoon and evening. <laughs> and I can remember sitting on Ted Chapman's lawn over there watching these trucks go round and round. They'd go, up, they'd go around the common, around Bethel End, and they'd go around town. And it was a major thing, and I'll never forget it, because when our people came back from Vietnam and everything, who cared? Yeah. You know, and, uh, I'll always remember that. that uh, people were really pleased the war was over. Yeah, it's quite I think that, uh, Stan, I think... I was old enough in the 50s that I should have remembered the Korean War. But I think it was a low-key, low-profile thing because I have no vivid memories of, you know, three years of war, you know, yeah. think that somebody would. I think everybody remembered Sig Olsen when he was captured and died over that. I think that's the only memory I have. I remember hearing people talk about it, but uh, that's all I remember. And I think uh, I mean, somebody else may have well, no, no, I don't know. No, I say the leather, leather mailbag, Parker Brown threw out of the B-24 when it was headed yeah. overseas, yeah. landed down in what we call Ernest Buck's house, which, right. who's the lady who lives there now? Oh, I, what is her name? I can't recall her name. Down on Railroad Street. Yeah. Anyway, that bag of letters from these soldiers landed in that field behind that house. I can remember seeing that come down. Yeah. Stan, you can't forget that Doc Carroll did something very special, and I'm sure most everybody knows what it was, but it was one of my fondest memories is going to Bosman's and going to the soda fountain and, ha and ordering a lemon Coke or cherry Coke and watching him toss that glass up. And it was just a, it was a really special treat. But before he gave it to you, he, he always gave you also this little lesson on life, too. So you always think, well, who's got that? Uh, uh, Al Carroll. Al Carroll. Oh, Al Carroll. Carroll. Well, he called my, always would ask me, well, how's the million dollar baby? <laughs> my daughter had eczema, and it cost it cost a lot of money to feed her. So we called her the million dollar baby. <laughs> okay, let's move on then to um, uh, childhood friends. This, uh, somebody want to describe a childhood friend that's going to touch Brown. with, Packer touch, Brown, touch, Brown. touch with after all these years. I'm looking for a discussion of you know, people you knew when you were child, yep. in your childhood, and. Uh, you still are friends with after all these years. Does anybody have any of those experiences? Yeah? Okay. My best friend is right on the other side of you. <laughs> Rachel, yeah. <laughs> we grew up together. Okay, that's Betty good. Betty Warren, Betty Smith. Oh, I don't know. I just consider all the kids that, were in, uh, that we were in class with as my friends. And thank God. In my class, there were a lot of them that have passed away. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of them, too, that... Uh, still around, and I keep in touch with a lot of them. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else? Alan? Yeah, the uh, Wormer Truck Boys lived down on High Street where Jackie Krause lives today. I'm not sure that's the right name now, but, but uh, those boys grew up with us, and Dad taught <coughs> the two boys to drive. I was dumb as hell. I couldn't learn to drive. My father says, you'll never learn to drive. You'll never do it. And he used to take us down to the dump. The dump was down the bank of Alder River and the Andescoggin River. And he had the Jeep and the trailer, and he would let Roy or Bobby back the thing right up to the bank and throw the trash in the river. He wouldn't let me even get the other side of the river. <laughs>
an institution and then they move on the outside of uh, where the tracks are on the uh, bus barn, which got flooded out every spring. And I'm very happy to see that he moved his business back into Bethel after being absent for quite a few years. Anybody else? Anybody to think? She would just land in my dooryard, and it's just, it's just wonderful because her parents kind of took me under their wing. I was the uh, the uh, farm girl that they brought into town and showed her how to ski and go down the old the road toe and and dig and dig. That's good. Yeah. And I think it's amazing for the people that I used to hang around with how many have left. to the question of uh, adults. Who was the most significant adult in your, besides your family in your growing up years? Let's see if anybody has any comments on that. How do you have a comment on that? Well, I want to put down in my notes is the way a lot of people talk about Norris Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think probably Norris had a lot to do with me standing up straight in my life. Uh, uh, he used to come in the house in the morning folks house in the morning at noon time and after work every day every day and every time he'd see me he'd say Zane stand up straight put your shoulders back he always called me Zane so I was round shouldered as a devil and Norris used to grab me pull my shoulders back and says come on stand up straight and kept years he did that to me well Norris taught me to dance over in that kitchen <laughs> he was about five years older than I was probably why I haven't done a very good dance today, because I don't think he was so great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my mother, my mother let me, after I go to the dance, she let me go with him. If she only had known him, but he was good, a good fellow. I mean, I was just a young man. But he took me over to Nuri Connor with the sugar and off. <laughs> and we danced and we had sugar and off. But I told him recently, one day in the bank, when he got off a smart relax, I said, if my mother had ever known how you performed today, she wouldn't have let me go across the street and you would dead. He was really, he was all right. I mean, uh, just, yeah, yeah, just uh, one thing about Norris that, uh, that I really appreciated when I was uh, early in high school, I guess. Saturdays, I always went with Norris. He had a logging jobs all over Maine and New Hampshire. And the company he worked for, he'd go around and visit the logging crew, have some logging crews. And, Norris would get me to go with him every Saturday, and boy, that was a treat for me to go in a logging camp and uh, have lunch with the guys, and, uh, and uh, I always remember it. The favorite was uh, fried egg sandwiches, what they'd always bring up. <laughs> when the cook would ask you what you wanted, it was black coffee and fried egg sandwiches. Uh, I just wanted to read in the record of my quote, George and Dan Nixon would quit be here tonight, but uh, George Nixon says uh, the people were reported to him uh, Daisy Bryant, I spent many days on her porch listening to her, and I learned that older people could teach me a lot of things. She had a beautiful, these beautiful flowers, and she taught me respect for growing things. Stan Davis, I worked in his building's supply store, taking inventory with Howard Gunther. I acquired a respect for money and knowledge of checks and balances there at an early age. And then Norman Stone was another influence, he said, taught me how to listen fast. <laughs> Uh, 
Besides my immediate family, two people who played a big part of my life as a child were my great aunts, Myra Stevens and Mara Webster. I would go to their house often after school when my mother was giving piano lessons. Aunt Myra would uh, read poetry out loud to me and taught me the correct way to read the phrasing in a poem. I always think of her when I hear somebody reading a poem in a sing-song fashion that makes me cringe. <laughs> she gave me some of my first books and encouraged my love of reading. Aunt Mara was an art teacher and gave lessons in drawing and painting when I was young, which provided the foundation for the hobbies that I enjoy so much today. So that's you an idea of some of the things that uh, somebody else has some other people that they yeah. like. My person I remember very well, and he was awful good here. All the kids, we'd go down to his house with Wesley Wheeler, and he'd take us down to the train station, and we got to know some of the engineers on the trains. They'd be the same ones that every now and then they'd squirt the hose at us. But uh, Wesley. <laughs> Wesley was another driver that uh, could have used an automatic transmission. <laughs> he was the best driver, but he, he let us find him back in the truck and we didn't get the van. You know the last of his driving, Clay was working in the post office, and he yeah, had a rope around his right. foot. <laughs> he'd pull it. When he, he couldn't lift his foot, he'd just take the rope and pull it back. So he'd back up and he wouldn't look, and he'd, he'd run right at the back of the post office. <laughs>
Are you adding this to wing? Well, just, if you, if you, if you we don't have to, we don't have time. Yeah. Okay. If, if you just could recite something. If you All want, right. Just uh -huh. cite something. That, that's, my name is Martha Stowell. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. That's the second time tonight somebody's come to the Sorry, I, I, I thought you were. Okay. At, at the recent passing of um, Kenneth Wayne, my brother Pete um, took the time to write down several of his memories of, um, of this man who was a state trooper in the, the town of Bethel, and we grew up in West Bethel during the 50s and 60s. And, um, let me see, just, just to uh, cite something from this. Um, my brother Pete was very excited to think we had moved from the small town of Andover to a place where a state trooper was needed. <laughs> so Pete was 10 when we moved to West Bethel. I was about six. Uh, and Pete says, then one day I saw him. I just saw him, that's all. Something like this couldn't be planned. I was just walking down the street, and there he was, cruising through the town on his way to somewhere. Wow, what a feeling. A real state trooper, and his name was Wing. I knew that because my friend had told me so. And just because he was a state trooper, he was one of my first role models, one of the first people I looked up to. I just had good feelings about him, that's all. I felt safer knowing he was around. There were other heroes before him, of course, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and maybe some other movie stars. But Kenneth Wing was flesh and blood. He was real, and he was part of my town. And, and there's much more to this, and it's, it's exceptionally good. But thank you for letting me cite that. Anybody got anything else? Quick comments for the merit. Well, one thing I'll talk about out of the service, we didn't have any money, but we needed a place to know that this was different. All we had to do was look to the Bethel Savings Bank and tell them we wanted to buy the, dock, the house white place. Oh yes, no problem. They gave us some money. We paid $25 a month uh, for the payment and that was it. And all the time we lived there 25 years and we never had a key to the place. It's right on Main Street. And if you people remember, Asia Smith and Jack Matheson used to walk the beat at night. They walked the beat all night on the sidewalk. And Asa would have this club. And I defied anyone to uh, defy anything against him. So that's quite a change from trying to buy a house now and because we since have sold it. But. Okay. Anybody else? Uh,
for your uncle said then, and you're a lot younger than I am, so he must have kept cows quite a long time after I grew up. But that house was, now it's where the deli is. It's the Sid Jordan. Yeah. Of course, Ernie Walker lived at Barnabas. We kids had anything to sell. He was always there to give us a nickel. <laughs> and so, and Tom Brown's house has changed. I don't know. You know, when you get old, you hate to see the old places, the on um, Main Street built. The, new ho the old homes change and the businesses. But that's because, you know, you're old and you hate, some people hate to see change, I do. But, yes, Dan. Yes, what, what, I, what bothers me the most, I don't mind the changes. I expect these things will happen with Sunday River. But the traffic in, on Main Street and trying to find a place to park to get into the post office or go shopping or even at the, the pharmacy, you can't get in there. But another thing, coming either going out of town on Route 26 or coming into town, what a mess that is in there. about a couple of things that are sometimes described as the clients. Comments, for instance, about the traffic. Uh, I think we may be fortunate to have a couple of uh, really bypass roads. Mother's Lane, now Route 5. The Corsco Drive, I guess officially called Parkway. Is, uh, uh, that's, uh, I think that's now labeled as, as Route 26, isn't it? But uh, that, that's taking some pressure off. I, I think it was only yesterday that I was told, it was today in fact, that there's a nice church right in the middle of Freeport that's become practically unusable because the people can't park anywhere near it on a Sunday. <coughs> so it could be an awful lot worse here, and I think that whatever we think of uh, devastation uh, or development away from the traditional village, it's probably taking pressure off from in a way that Stan, for instance, would appreciate. And that is, it's probably going to slow the rate of converting big old houses in the village into office space and shops. There's more chance for them to live this life longer, I think, if, if there's a, some overflow space on the edges. I miss all the trees on Main Street. When I was a